bear with me. Um, we're even implying that we can continue as a society by setting levels of consumption, just a thinner form of energy in order to consume. It's on, it just is low, so if you can also project. You chose the wrong person. <laughs> okay, so um, transitioning forward in a way that doesn't leave people behind, is that an implication that we can continue our con uh, same consumption levels, um, just through a cleaner form of, form of energy to do so? Or is the idea of energy consumption and progressing forward with alternative energies problematic in and of itself? So um, a question kind of about the world views in society and how you see the transition taking place at that level. This questioner is concerned with a transition that doesn't challenge the superstructure but just shifts consumptive behaviors to other energy sources. That was one question. Uh, second question, what indigenous solutions would you like to share with all Canadians who are listening? We are all in this together. Third question is about the focus on workers, coded as wage earners. People living in poverty are already pushed to the margins and just transitions must go beyond people, um, how they will continue to sell their labor in the marketplace. So for example, there was housing retrofitting in the 1970s, but it was oriented to homeowners. Okay. Claire? Sure, so I'll, I'll start. Um, I also want to add that $50 million, I would also sink that into Indigenous climate action because these are the people on the ground that are supporting the communities doing that work. Um, and so I, I like the first two questions there about um, the worldview changing because of course that was kind of the key message that I wanted to bring here. Um, and I think a lot of the solutions, um, so I think this, the two questions are related. What are the Indigenous solutions and then can we just tweak the system um, with renewables or does it require a worldview? So to me those two are, are related. My answer answers both of them. Um, looking at our Indigenous teachings, um, I would really, you know, we're in an era of globalization and constantly expanding growth as a measurement of success. And I really think that that entire mindset and approach needs to change. And nowhere in our Indigenous communities does that does that exist, does that, because it is recognized as inherently unsustainable and destructive to all life forms, including ourselves. So I would really be focusing more on um, localization. And I mean, globalization has brought a lot of benefits, which I do um, appreciate and I actually um, have benefited from in this current society, um, but would really look at extreme localization. So for example, um, a number of years ago, my husband read a book called um, Red Alert by Dr. Daniel Wild from down in the United States and it talked about in indigenuity and so that we would need to take an indigenous approach to climate solutions and so one of the examples he gave in that book was about housing and so right now we have standardized housing across North America um, and so we would look at what different regions, what makes sense for housing in that region, using materials from that region because it's already acclimatized and then building structures in such a way that it would mitigate any um, destruction um, or effects from the, the weather patterns that are um, expected in that area. So in tornado regions, so how would our buildings withstand um, extreme winds like that, whether they're plow winds or circular tornado winds. Um, if, if you're in a humid or a damp area versus a dry area, cold, extreme cold. But, so all the things that we're seeing, I would really look at that. And so even at First Nations levels, when we're looking at housing, I mean, we have a housing crisis right across um, all, all the communities across Canada, and uh, much of that is because we are importing these cheap, materials that don't make sense for those regions and they're they're full of problems so i would um look at that kind of thing as, as far as an indigenous solution is really looking at what that area so that answers the other question because that's a complete mindset shift um also i would stop with this idea of constant growth because i we haven't been able to find anything in the natural world that grows without stopping except cancer so if there is another example i would like to hear that and so, and we're exporting this idea around the world too. So, um, and, and, and the localization too, when we produce things locally, you know, we're, we're deeply affected by it. We can't ignore the fact that Chinese people are living with intense smog so that we could have cheap stuff here and continue this luxurious lifestyle. When you localize, you, you know, it's like a whole thing, like what's the world temperature this morning? And it's like, well, well, how are the people in China breathing? How are the people in South America doing today? Like we. We can take these concepts of, of this globalization, but really say, how are my local 
impacts or, or decisions impacting that. And I'll pass this on. I could go on for a while. I'll try and answer a couple of those questions quickly. One is, do we need to change the levels of consumption? The, the short answer is yes. Um, I guess the idea behind uh, some of what, what I'm suggesting is that it's, the tr transition implies that there's a timeline. So it's not overnight, but yes, in the long term, we need to change our consumption patterns. And that, and that doesn't just mean like we, we buy less stuff. Consumption means like how big of a house do we, do we occupy? Um, how do we move ourselves around, you know? But that's all consumption, all of that produces pollution, and yes, that needs to change. Uh, just the timeline is not overnight. We're looking for, for different kinds of energy and different kinds of consumption. It's five, 10, 20 years, but ultimately, yes, we need to, especially like a, a, an actual carbon neutral economy is a, is a radical fundamental shift in how, how we operate, and that will require, uh, a, I mean, change at every level of society. Um, what I was kind of talking about earlier is basically the first steps. How do we start moving people in that direction? Um, and there's a really good question about, yeah, the, the preoccupation with workers or wage earners versus like actual people in the community. And I'm gonna talk about a bit more about this later, um, but this is a, it's a huge issue. And to spoil my own presentation, one of the examples is Alberta has this program for coworkers where they get, uh, if you get laid off as a coworker, you get a, a $12,000 tuition venture to get new skills to get a new job. That's great for coworkers, but if you're a service worker in that community, like if you sell food to coworkers and the coal plant shuts down, you're also out of a job, but you get no transition support from the government. So there's some really, uh, these are really important issues that when we talk about just transition, it's, it includes everybody um, and not just, not just wage earners. under an economic system that is premised on growth for growth's sake, and that needs to change. Um, and what I really wouldn't like to see for a just transition is just replacing um, our energy sources, because I'm looking at Colleen Thomas right in front of me right now and thinking about um, the ways, for example, in which some of the uh, minerals and metals that are needed for the production of solar panels are also exploiting people on, other, on the other side of the earth. Um, so we need to change, these are really big picture things, but we need to change the economic system in which we live and we need to have it oriented not around um, growth for growth's sake. I'm going to shut up now.